Hi, Green Bluffs. Hey, it's good to see y'all uh, this morning. We're on our couch, which is different than a normal mm -hmm. Sunday. I hope you're staying warm in the midst of uh, this cold spell and staying safe. Uh, but this morning, we get the opportunity to worship from home together. And uh, a couple things I want to make you aware of before we start our service this morning. One is that uh, this is obviously Valentine's Day. So uh, hug your family and enjoy your loved ones uh, that you're celebrating with today. <laughs> it's good to have mine right here. And I uh, just want to let you know also that uh, there's a resource uh, at greenvilleoaks.org slash family. It's our date night kit. And so uh, tonight or in the coming week, you may have an opportunity to celebrate with a loved one, and uh, there's some great questions and notes you can write to each other, so uh, download those resources there. And in addition, next Sunday is our Discover Green Oaks class. So if you're new to us, wanting to find out more about membership, uh, maybe you've been joining us online and, and you're ready to find out more about our church family and you've never been on a Sunday morning. If you feel comfortable to come in person, we'd love to have you next Sunday. And you can sign up for that class at greenvilleoaks.org slash hub. And on that website, you can look for Discover Greenville Oaks and sign up. Uh, and if you decide to come next week and don't sign up, we'll, we'll be glad to have you as well. But this morning, uh, we're excited to, to worship with you. Have your communion ready. Uh, sing, uh, Be ready to sing together. We're going to be singing loud, right? And uh, look forward to uh, being together again for those who are live uh, next Sunday day together. Good morning, church. It's inclement weather outside. But our hearts are full of delight in the Lord this morning. Let's worship together. Let God arise.
indeed, indeed. Let God arise on this Lord's day as the snow has fallen all around us and the streets are iced over. We uh, recorded this on Friday night uh, in anticipation of the fact that we might not be able to come out to live worship in person. But you know, God is so good to us with all of the technology and all the other things that we have at our disposal. Oh, it's good. And it's great to let God uh, arise inside our hearts and our spirits this morning. Uh, Some of you know I was a little under the weather for a week or two, and uh, that's why I'm gasping for air right now. But uh, man, I got to tell you, being alive is a beautiful thing. So thank you, uh, church, for all of your prayers and all your concerns for me. We want to welcome everybody this morning to the Greenville Oaks Church of Christ. Uh, Whether you're online or in the house, you're not in the house, obviously, but uh, no matter what, whether you've clicked in for the first time or the thousandth time, we want to let you know that you are welcomed here. And this is a church that, that wants to lead people into a closer walk with Jesus. So if there's anything that we can do to bless your life. If you have a spiritual concern this morning, if you'll contact us through the website, we would love to follow up with you, especially in this kind of downtime when the weather has got us hibernating. There may be some things mulling around in your heart and your mind that uh, maybe you'd like to talk to someone about. Get in touch with us and we can uh, make sure that happens. God is good all the time. He is the everlasting God. And we're going to sing to that fact right now. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God will reign forever, our hope, our strong.
the king of these people You're the lord of this nation You are You're the light of this darkness You're the hope to the hopeless You're the peace to the restless You are There is no one of this city, you're the king of these people, you're the lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the so much truth in that song God is the God of the city he's the God of the country he's the God, God of all nations Jesus said in his ministry that if we had just faith as small as a mustard seed I didn't really understand what that meant until I went to the grocery store one day with the intent purpose of buying a little and it wasn't very big a little jar of mustard seeds I keep them in my office now. They are so tiny. I mean, when you're using it on your hot dog, mustard sauce, you wouldn't think that. But these seeds are so small. And yet Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, 
you could say to that mountain over there, be moved, and it would be moved. Mm. Because of some of the things that I went through the last few weeks, I've got a renewed feeling about life and a purpose and the reason, perhaps, that I'm here. And I'm convicted that when God is the God of our hearts, when he's the God of our minds, when he is the God of our city, amazing things will begin to happen. It all rests in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ died, and you know, it so easily could have been the end when they placed him in that grave. But on the third day, the stone was rolled away. Jesus Christ emerged from that hillside tomb never to die again. He is the resurrected king. He is God forevermore. He's the God of the city. This morning, I pray that you, as we take communion together, that you will re-emerge in that reality into the city in which we live. Once all the ice melts, <laughs> once all the snow is gone, I pray that we'll step back into this city and make a difference because God is the everlasting God. Let's pray. Lord, as we take this communion meal together, may you be glorified first and foremost, but may our hearts be renewed. May we be restored into the knowledge and the faith and the confidence that you are the God of the city. May it be forevermore, God, in your name.
Well, good morning, Greenville Oaks. Uh, it is a cold morning, and I hope you're staying warm inside, and uh, I hope the worship has been a blessing so far. And I'm excited to share with you from chapter 20 of the story. It's the story in the book of Esther. And I want to start by setting the context for today's message. The context is really important because I tend to get a little fuzzy about the uh, timeline and geography when it comes to this last part of the Old Testament. And even more confusing, if you were to open your Bibles to the book of Esther, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere near the end of the Old Testament. In fact, last week's story, this week's story, and next week's story will round out the Old Testament, but they're not found at the end. They're actually, in our Bibles, found a little before the middle of the Old Testament. Last week was the story of Ezra, this week the story of Esther, and next week we'll talk about the story of Nehemiah. And again, these books aren't anywhere near the last half of the Old Testament, at least when you open your Bibles. But remember, the Old Testament isn't organized chronologically. So it can be confusing what books belong in what part of the history of Israel. And this is how the story is helpful. It helps us see the overarching story of God and his people. And chronologically, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah uh, comes and is set in the final years of the exile. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, some of the Israelites have been uh, able to return to their home. Remember, there were 50,000 of them that returned to Jerusalem in the story of, uh, of Ezra and, they, and Haggai, and they, they actually rebuild the temple of the Lord there. Uh, but there's others that acclimate in Babylon and Persia, and they stay there. Now, the king at this time uh, in the book of Esther is a guy named Xerxes, which if you're ever looking for a, a Scrabble word that starts with X, well, I guess there's two X's. That makes that hard. But it's a great way, a different kind of name, right? And, and Xerxes is this king who, who exists about 500 years before the time of Jesus being born into the world. At this time, Persia is the most powerful empire in the entire world. But as Scripture seems determined to do, it isn't near as interested in the lives of the rulers of the great empires of its day. Scripture seems much more interested in the lives of foreigners who are forced into difficult situations far from home, whom God uh, moves and works within. While Pharaoh runs the world in the book of Exodus, the Bible is much more interested in Moses and the Hebrews. While Nebuchadnezzar and Darius run the world uh, during the time of Daniel, Scripture seems more focused on Daniel and his friends. In a couple weeks, we'll read the story of the birth of Jesus. And even though history may be more focused on Caesar Augustus and King Herod, Scripture seems more focused on Jesus and the 12 disciples. And the same thing is true in this story. Xerxes is kind of a minor character. And Esther, of all things, this queen becomes the central focus with Mordecai and the rest of the Jewish people. And I can't emphasize how important this is, that where Scripture decides to zoom in its lens tells us something about who God sees. And so in our day, it's easy to think that maybe God's more focused on global events and world leaders, but I want to assure you, God sees the faithful minor characters in the story, and he sees us today. I want to begin with prayer as we open God's word this morning. God, I thank you for the story of Esther, a story and a reminder of what it means to, to be faithful in the midst of challenging times, a story of, uh, of, of the experience of, of powerful um, and influential women who speak up and are faithful to you and, and, and work against uh, the, the evil dictates of kings. So God, I pray today you would pour through me the gift of preaching so that Christ should be formed in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there's an irony that I'm bringing this story to you on Valentine's Day because this is not a romantic story, though it has sometimes been couched in those kind of terms. Now, you can make the book of Ruth into a romantic story about Boaz taking care of Ruth and kinsman redeemers, but not Esther. Growing up, I heard this story of Esther preached as if she was like a Disney princess. Heard it like a rags to riches story, a kind of Cinderella story. Now, if you remember back to the Disney story of Cinderella, she was a mistreated orphan who ended up marrying the prince and living happily ever after. After all, if you remember any verse from the book of Esther, Sounds a little bit like a Disney story. Esther 4, verse 14, listen to this. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. If you remember any verse from this book, it's probably that one. For such a time as this. But as we'll come to see, this story is no fairy tale. In fact, as I wrote this message, I was thinking that my daughters would be in children's worship, and I was hoping they would get to hear this message. And so uh, 
Brooklyn and, and Addison, I'm glad you're sitting beside me this morning getting to hear this because this is a story about an important role that a young woman can play in a mostly male celebrated world. And, and really, in, as you look at our Bibles, there are many more male characters that we celebrate. Esther is a book for the little guy, or perhaps better said, the little girl. Esther is a book for the people whose odds are stacked against them. And the women in this book have more power than the culture imagined they could have at that time. The first woman mentioned in this book is worthy of admiration and emulation. Her name is Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti is married to King Xerxes. So the story begins with Xerxes throwing this six-month-long party throughout the Persian kingdom, celebrating his and his kingdom's vast wealth and glory. At the end of the six months, Xerxes throws a, a private party in his royal court that lasts another seven days. Think of it as the after party. The best food and wine he had to offer flowed nonstop for all of his buddies for seven days. In the meantime, his wife, Queen Vashti, threw a banquet for all the women of the royal court in another location. At the end of the seven days, Xerxes is no doubt loaded on food and wine and wanted to show his wife Vashti off to all his guests to display her beauty. And while the English translations we often read innocently translates the king's request to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her crown, the Hebrew actually says something a little different. The king asked his queen to come with nothing but her crown. Vashti refuses. And when he asks for the advice of his wise men, one of his attendants says this. You can read with me along in the story or in Esther, chapter 1 beginning in verse 16. Then Memukin replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the province of king, the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands. From the least to the greatest, the king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his household using his native tongue. Now, despite the darkness of the book of Esther, this is actually intended, this book, to have some comedy and irony in this story. Vashti, this queen, stands up to the king, and, and then one of the king's men, who just happens to be a eunuch, which is an important detail, tells, tells Xerxes not to put up with such disrespect. Because if the rest of the wives hear about Vashti's disobedience, then the rest of the women in the kingdom might disobey their husbands. Now, it's meant to be funny, right? Here's a eunuch reminding the king to be a man and control his wives. But it's not funny at all, really. I mean, look at verse 19. It says, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Now, what does better than she mean? Well, it's pretty obvious to me that better, uh, that better uh, means in this story more submissive in this context. Now, any of you uh, volunteering to be Xerxes' wife, if that's the uh, context of what a better wife means? And did you catch the end of verse 22? The king makes a decree. The king makes a decree proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his household, which is almost the exact language of the curse in Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me there, if you would, to, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Remember the story we read earlier in the story. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful, painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, Remember this. The curse is not the way God intended for the world to be. It's the result of sin. And in Genesis, man ruling over woman is actually the opposite of God's best. It's the curse. God is saying because of the sin in the garden, men are going to rule over women. 
And sure enough, in the story of Esther, the king makes a law that men should rule over women. And that's the way the pursuit of power goes. You can be a leader or ruler by title, but it's obvious in Esther that the emperor has no clothes. No law can force humans to give their obedience, as you're going to see in the rest of the story. So with Vashti gone, the king needs a new woman he can rule over. So he forces uh, women to come to the palace for 12 months of beauty treatments before having a night with the king, and that's where Esther enters the story. Now let's be honest for a moment about what this story is and what it isn't. She's not a willing contestant on The Bachelor. She is a young orphan whose beauty won her a place in the king's harem. She's not a Disney princess or a beauty contest contestant. She's a young girl being forced into sleeping with the king. Whether we like to admit it or not, the Bible was written at a time in history when most women were owned by their husbands, seen as property. And at the end of the contest, and only God knows how many women pass through King Xerxes' bedroom, Esther is chosen as Xerxes' next queen. And queen Esther doesn't have power like we might have imagined when we read the children's Bible story. Queen Esther is one disobedient step away from ending up deposed like Queen Vashti. And ultimately, it took the defiance of both Vashti and Esther to save the Jewish people. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So as the story continues, we meet two more key characters, Haman and Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is Esther's older cousin, and he had raised uh, Esther as his own daughter because she had no father or mother. And so Esther and Mordecai were Jews who were exiled in Persia, but Mordecai uh, told Esther not to reveal her nationality and family background. Apparently, that wouldn't have been an advantage in this whole harem situation. Haman was one of Xerxes' highest officials. And every time he passed by the king's date, all of the royal officials would kneel down to pay honor to Haman. But Mordecai refused to bow down or to pay any honor to him, which infuriated Haman. So Haman came up with a plan that he was going to kill Mordecai. But he wasn't content to just kill Mordecai. He pitched a proposal to Xerxes to kill every Jew in the whole kingdom uh, of Xerxes. So Haman went to the king and told him that there's this certain people in the kingdom whose customs are different than the rest of his kingdom and who refuse to obey the king's laws. And the king granted Haman's request to destroy, kill, and annihilate that people group. But the king didn't realize that he just okayed the death of his very queen, Esther. He didn't know that Esther was a Jew. Well, when Mordecai hears the decree, he tells Esther to beg for mercy from the king so that her people wouldn't be killed. But there was a problem. Because a man or a woman who approached the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king had to be put to death unless the king extended the gold scepter that he had to spare his or her life. And then there's that famous line we read earlier from Mordecai to Esther. And who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. Now that's the quote we remember. That's the verse we've memorized if we are familiar with the story. But I want to keep reading in uh, Esther chapter 4, verse 16. This is how Esther responded to that famous line. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. This is the reply that Esther gives to Mordecai. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I think that's a remarkable statement in response. Maybe we should memorize that just as much as the, for such a time as this line. To me, Esther's response, and if I perish, I perish, sounds a lot like a story we read a couple of weeks ago. It sounds like the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to King uh, that was there in, in the book of Daniel. They refused to bow down to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. So they're going to be thrown into a blazing furnace. But before they're thrown in, you remember what they say to the king? I want to read it again. We read it a couple weeks ago in, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and following. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. 
If you're wondering what it looks like to be a faithful Christian in the midst of empires and countries that don't always follow God, this is it. Over and over again, God's people have been willing to give up their lives rather than deny their God. And if I perish, I perish. That sounds a lot like the kind of faith we ought to have. So what happens? Well, Esther enters the inner court of the palace, and when the king saw Queen Esther standing there, he was pleased with her. And he held out to her his gold scepter in his hand. And the king said, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. And I don't know if Esther is still working up the courage to make the request or what, but she says, I'd like to invite you and Haman to a banquet I've prepared, I've prepared for you. And at the banquet, Xerxes says, now tell me your request. And again, Esther replies, um, why don't we have another banquet tomorrow night, right? The food's been good. Can we do this again tomorrow night? She's still working up the courage. So apparently, you're still considered faithful to God, even if it take a, takes a couple of attempts to work up the courage to make the important ask. Well, that night, a couple of important things happen. Haman goes home furious because Mordecai is still not bowing down to him. And his wife, the graceful person that she is, encourages Haman to have a 75-foot-tall gallows built for Mordecai to be impaled on. There's an idea. And on the same night, King Xerxes is having trouble sleeping. So he asks his servants to bring him the Book of Chronicles, which is basically a record of all the great things he had done as king. Hey, we all have our favorite bedtime reading to go to sleep to, right? But while he's reading about himself, he comes across a story about Mordecai. A while back, Mordecai overheard two of the king's officers conspiring to assassinate King Xerxes. So Mordecai told Esther, who informed the king, who then uh, killed off those officers hatching an assassination attempt. Well, Xerxes had forgotten about that event. So he asked his officials, well, what honor has Mordecai received for this? And they said, nothing's been done for him. So the king calls in Haman. <laughs> and uh, this is a great part of the story. Uh, he calls him in and he says, hey, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And Haman has enough ego to think he's talking about him. Uh, so he said this in Esther chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes, let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on a horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. So the king has Haman lead Mordecai through the streets, proclaiming loudly, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And it turned backwards on Haman. And it had to be a sweet reversal for Mordecai. But that night, Haman goes to dinner for a second time with uh, Esther and the king, and he's furious. So the next evening, King Xerxes asks Esther again what it is she wants. And Esther responded boldly this time, with courage, saying this in Esther chapter 7, verse 3 and following. Then Queen Esther answered, If I've found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to the height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. And eventually the king makes another edict, allowing the Jews to protect themselves, and the Jews triumphed over their enemies who tried to attack them. Now Esther's a great story. But there's one detail that you may not know about this book that I find really interesting. 
Did you know that the book of Esther uh, was a book that almost didn't make it into the canon? The reason for that is that the name of God is never mentioned one time in the book of Esther. Now, I know that makes you want to go back and flip back through it, because you, you know God's in the story, right? Esther is the only book, though, in the entire Bible that never explicitly includes God in the narrative, which seems like a glaring omission. But for some of us, if we were to write our own story, it might be hard to know where to put God's name in our story. Perhaps we feel like he's been absent. Perhaps he hasn't shown up in the ways we'd wanted him to. And the book of Esther is a reflection on life under enemy rule. And during those moments of living under the rule of another, another empire, the people of God have often asked a question. Maybe it's a question you're familiar with. Where is God? Why is God not showing up in the timeline we want in the way we'd expect? And I think there's a, a hidden answer to that question writing right under our nose, hiding right there in the text. Because uh, what's interesting is, do you know what Esther's name means in the Hebrew? This is really interesting. It, it comes from a Hebrew root word that means hidden. And I love this. I, I'm guessing there were times when Esther thought God was absent. After all, God's name doesn't even make the book or the final edit of her book. But there's a huge difference between saying God is hidden and saying God is absent. God's not absent in this story. You can find him peeking in and out of the story. You, you can't quite put your finger on him. But you know he's there if you have eyes to see. He's Esther. He's hidden. And I have to think there are some of you out there who are questioning if God is there in your life right now. And it's a hard truth, but it's true in my life. God isn't as easily seen in real time as we'd like often. Most often in my life, I see him peeking in and out of the story in my rear view mirror. It's like my side view mirror says, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. So if you ever have a question, where's God? Here's what I would encourage you to do. Open up to the table of contents in your Bible and find where the book of Esther is and open up to the book of Esther. All you have to do is mouth the title of the book and remember that God's not absent. He's just hidden. So aren't you glad they decided to put Esther in the canon? I know I am. Let's pray as we close our time in the word this morning. Father, for all those right now who feel as if you are hidden, who pray prayers and wonder if they have glass ceilings that our prayers don't reach you, who wonder like the Israelites at this time, I'm sure, uh, if maybe other gods were more powerful because uh, the king seems more powerful and he doesn't worship Yahweh. Pray right now that we would remember this story. We remember the powerful uh, example of Vashti who stands up against the king in his unrighteous uh, request. That we remember Esther who in the moment where courage is needed speaks up on behalf of her people. That we remember Mordecai who refuses to bow down to uh, to those in power just because they need their ego stroked, God, but who seek to be your people, who seek to remind those around them that even if your name doesn't explicitly show up in this book of Esther, that you're there and you're hidden all along the way. So God, would you show up in your hiddenness? Would you remind us of your presence? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's been good to be with you this morning, to worship from home. I hope today's been a blessing for you. And our prayer is that God will go with you and that you'll be blessed and you experience the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, and the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.